people wanted what was outlined to them in, in their country's constitution. They wanted to democratically elect a president. And we'll see, you know, in the next 120 days if that happens. Hi, I'm Neelu Tabrizi. Welcome to On the Line. Today we're going to discuss Haiti. Last week we were there to see Michelle Martelli step down and saw the country uh, choose its new interim president. So Michael, what awesome people do we have on the show today? Oh, we have the most awesomest people in the entire world, I think. Uh, a bunch of them are here. Let's start with Kush. He's pretty awesome. Kush, are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. Kush, you have an excellent name. What Haiti dilemmas can we solve for you today? Awesome. I think it is a good name. Um, so. I guess uh, my biggest questions are, first off, why is it so difficult to even find out uh, what's going on in Haiti? If you do a quick Google search, very little uh, even pops up. And then because of that, uh, I'm curious about, you know, what do protesters really want? Is it an issue of political uh, transparency? This kind of, to me, seems like a slap in the face to democracy. Um, but I really want to get a sense of what the protesters want and how, what specific changes uh, they, they want the government to make? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so to talk about your first one, why don't we see a lot of people covering Haiti? Well, it's tough because, it's, again, it's just really hard to communicate a story, a story to your audience that might seem like it doesn't affect them. So there are a few outlets that cover it really closely and have journalists that are based there that, that are their correspondents. So, for example, I really like Jacqueline Charles, who's the Caribbean correspondent of the Miami Herald. She covers that region very well. But you're right, for most other mainstream networks, it was kind of a blackout on what's going on in Haiti. And for us at Vice News, we thought it was a really important story to cover. We wanted to go see what it looked like to have the you know the guy who's in charge during the during the uh, earthquake to step down and who would fill that vacuum. So we felt it was important, and that's why we were there. Um, and the second part of your question, if just to remind myself, you're asking what do protesters really want? What were they really angry about? Yeah. So what specifically are they angry about? Um, you know, is it political transparency? Uh, and then what specific changes, if any, uh, do they want the government to make? Yeah, absolutely. So I think first I'm going to throw to this clip, which might put it into a little bit of context. It's going to show um, it's going to show Simon interviewing a protester in Haiti last week. The, the, the population is angry now. Do you think that there's a potential for more violence if Martelli doesn't step down? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah, definitely. If, if he stay on, on seven, oh, yeah, there, there, there's going to be a lot of die. So just to put that into a little bit of context for you, that protester, what he was referring to was he wanted President Michelle Martelli to step down at the end of his five-year term, which he ended up doing last week. Um, and the issue there was that there was a big question of who was going to lead the country next. Michelle Martelli had someone in mind that, you know, a lot of, a lot of people felt like it, he was the wrong choice. He was just going to continue to be a puppet. So yes, people really do want transparency. And the sense that I got is that, you know, people wanted what was outlined to them in, in their country's constitution. They wanted to democratically elect a president. Um, and that's what the people really want to do. And we'll see, you know, in the next 120 days if that happens. Awesome. Yeah, did that answer your questions for you? Yeah, yeah. Overall, I mean, I think so they just uh, elected the, the parliament voted on a new president, correct? And is there have been any um, kind of protest about that process? Um, and the, I know it was like yesterday, right? Yeah. Kind of yeah, so it's kind of interesting. It definitely seemed a little House of Cards, Frank Underwood-esque. Um, and a lot of people called it a parliamentary coup because the gentleman who became president, <clears throat> excuse me, Jocelyn Prevert, he was senator, um, he was a senator of Haiti and one of the three people that came up with this whole plan to elect a temporary president in the first place. So indeed, yes, it was the parliament who chose the leader of the nation and, you know, his mandate is to be there for 120 days. But we'll have to check back and see how that plays out. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that, that definitely cleared things up for me on my end. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for asking your questions. Thank you. All right. Kush, thanks for coming on, man. So, Neela, we're seeing some stuff on Twitter that I want you to take a look at. Uh, the first is from uh, Vincente. Uh, he wants to know, how are people reacting uh, to the new president? And uh, why don't you think more people in the U.S. are paying attention? We're next-door neighbors, after all. 
Yeah, those are two really good questions. Um, and to answer the first part, how are the people reacting? Um, the sense that I got, you know, right after Jocelyn Prevert's inauguration on Sunday, we went out and were chatting with people in the street, and it seemed like there there were no protests because everyone wanted this interim, you know, transitional period of Haiti to go on. They wanted this to happen, and there's, everyone's just really looking forward to being able to democratically elect a president in 120 days. So it seems like people just want to get this over with as smoothly as possible. And you know, why maybe doesn't America care about Haiti? I mean, it just seems, again, it's just really hard to get people to care about an issue that's not directly affecting them right now. And in the U.S., I mean, we have, a, we have um, big presidential elections and, this, and primaries going on right now that, you know, our problems and our issues at home might be taking, taking precedence over, might be taking precedence rather over what we're paying attention to. Well, I hope that answers your question. Uh, so, speaking of questions, I know we have some more uh, on Skype, and let's go straight to Jeff, who's calling us from Lakeland, Florida. Hey, Jeff. Hi, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Uh, pretty good. I have, um, I was, you know, we all mentioned the earthquake happened. Everyone went down there and, you know, helped cleaned up, and we all kind of stopped hearing about it. Like you said, we have a lot going on here that doesn't allow us to invest a lot in Haiti, but, you know, like we said, it is, it is right there. And, you know, we have Cuba about to open up. Everyone's waiting to, you know, throw money at them. And Haiti's about, you know, that far away from Cuba. What keeps us from, you know, saying, hey, let's make a, you know, like a triangle there, like trade and, you know. Yeah, you know. absolutely. I mean, I, you know, why maybe aren't we investing in Haiti or other companies looking to invest there? That's a really good question. I think that, you know, it's important to recognize that Haiti at once was, you know, the region's top exporter of bananas. Like they do have, they can get involved in trade in a meaningful way, and they could also be a top coffee exporter and other things like that. But unfortunately, it's just the country has so much political instability that it makes it hard for investors to want to put their money there because they may not know what the fate of their company or the country's government might be in the next 100 days. So that, unfortunately, is a big barrier keeping any trade from happening, you know, right now during this instability. Does that yeah, answer that your was, question? Yeah, that answered the, the second part of my question. You know, there's like, you think there's like a, like a catch-22 going on instability, you know, wary investors leads with more instability, you know, it just kind of goes, you know, like a big cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I hope that they can get involved shortly, but we'll have to kind of see how, you know, politics plays out in the country because that's going to really lead whether or not they can get involved in trade. Okay, that's my, that was my questions. Awesome, thanks so much. No problem. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for coming on, man. So, Neelu, we got another qu uh, tweet that I want you to take a look at, and this is a little bit more of an explainer uh, for everybody watching at home. The new president, uh, Felix, wants to know, is he temporary, or have they actually done a presidential election? Can you explain a little bit of the, of the process of how the president, the new president came to power? Yes, it was an exciting 12-hour um, it was a 12-hour National Assembly session to pick the interim president. So yes, on uh, Saturday night, early Sunday morning is when Jocelyn Prevert was chosen by the National Assembly to be the interim president. And so far, his mandate says that he only has 120 days. Um, so essentially, he came up with this plan with another senator and Michelle Martelli to create this mandate for the temporary presidency. And um, people thought that was weird. Again, like we mentioned before, that he ended up being the leading candidate, despite the fact that he came up with this plan in the first place. And yes, his colleagues from the National Assembly chose him, and he's going to lead the country for 120 days. All right. Well, there is your answer, Felix. I hope you are satisfied with that. And uh, without any further ado, I know we have Adam, who wants to ask us about some tumultuous issues that were happening in Haiti. <laughs> Adam, you there? Yeah. Hi, Nilu. Hi, uh, Adam. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, big time fan. Um, I was wondering, uh, back to the process, I mean, you had mentioned, I think, in your dispatch that there was, a, like, it was an endurance test. So what made it an endurance test? I mean, obviously, it was 12 hours long, but, you know, you'd mentioned that the senators, I think, who had voted towards the end had mm -hmm. more power or, like, had more say. Like, what gave them more um yeah, I mean, I will say that the, this for me was the most marathon uh, endurance testing parliamentary session I've ever seen in my life. So to give you a little bit of a background, the session that day started about 5 p.m. A um, couple hours later, they said, kick all the journalists out. We're going to have a closed session. 
So we left, came back a couple hours later, and they were still debating that night around 7 p.m., are we going to elect the president or not? So there was a lot of confusion what was going on. They finally started the vote at 11.30 p.m. Because under the mandate of the rules, if they didn't start voting before midnight, this whole plan was completely scrapped. So they started voting at 11.30. Their first round of voting was a split vote between the top two candidates, uh, LeBlanc and Prevert. And so they had to do another vote. So keeping up with me. In between yeah. the first and second vote, they had another recess. Um, senators went out. We all were waiting to see what was going on. When they came back to vote the second time, Prevert had a landslide victory. The votes completely changed. So clearly some back backdoor negotiations and wheeling and dealing were, were definitely going on. Um, and I, you know, and I, to me, it really stood out that they were really pushing these po politicians, like, how long can you stay awake? Like, if someone had left the room, for example, it would have completely changed the voting structure and whether or not they could vote that night. So it was really keeping these guys in a room and um, seeing who they would vote for in the end. And in the end, it was Prevert. And wow. yeah, and we were there till about four in the morning. That's crazy. Um, how was local media's reaction to that? Like, were they covering it? I mean, I don't. Does it like mirror a U.S. presidential election or like were people No, all over absolutely. It? I mean, you know, a lot of the people that were print reporters were definitely home and monitoring it on Twitter. Um, but there was still there's a ton of camera crews at the end. I mean, when he was when Prevert was chosen as president, and he went up and resigned his senatorship and then did the oath, put on the sash. It was just media everywhere. It was a, it was a pretty crazy scrum typical to what, you know, we've seen in the U.S. So, yeah, yeah. it was definitely followed very closely. And how do people like on the street, how have they reacted to his election? I mean, I think he's known to have some former ties to President Aristide, who's ousted in a coup, and he can be seen as like kind of close to mm -hmm. the business elites there. Are they excited about him? Do they think it'll be a change from Martelli or do they think it's kind of like more of the same? You know, when after we spoke uh, to people outside following his inauguration on Sunday, people just seemed like they were kind of exhausted, tired, and, and over it. Like There was such a week of crazy protests leading up to Michelle Martelli stepping down. The people that we talked to were just kind of like, OK, he's the interim president. Let's get this over with in, in 120 days, as smooth as possible, and give us our chance to elect a president. So that's the sense that we got. But you know, before you know, the few days leading up to the selection in the National Assembly, uh, a lot of people thought that it was shady, that, hey, this guy came up with this plan in the first place, and now he's a leading candidate. What's going yeah. on with that? Um, and I want to throw to an interview that we had with Prevert. We were uh, among the last journalists to interview him while he was senator. So you can see a right. question we posed to him. If you get chosen by parliament to be the temporary president, do you pledge that you will step down after 120 days, no matter what happens? L'objet même d'un gouvernement provisoire, ses principales missions, c'est de réaliser les élections le plus tôt possible pour permettre à ce que des autorités légitimes puissent avoir la conduite des affaires de l'État. Il faut des consultations au niveau de tous les secteurs de la vie nationale pour avoir un nouveau gouvernement qui puisse inspirer confiance. Mais tout doit se faire dans un intervalle de 120 jours. Some people are, are criticizing you submitting your name for interim president because you were one of the politicians who came up with this whole plan for the temporary presidency in the first place. What do you make of that? L'accord a clairement dit des élections honnêtes, transparentes et inclusives. Ça n'exclut personne. So just a little bit of context for that. We waited around for him for about five hours to get a 10-minute interview. So we had to ask um, the questions that I knew that would piss him off basically immediately. Um, and so as you can kind of see in the interview, when we asked him if he would step down in 120 days no matter what, he did the amazing typical um, politicians speak of just kind of talking in circles and, oh, there's so much to do in 120 days. The mandate clearly says 120 days. But he never said, yes, I will step down. And again, when we asked him, do you feel it's shady that you're a leading candidate despite the fact that you made this plan, he said the rules clearly state that a Haitian citizen can be, that can come in for this temporary presidency, and I'm a Haitian citizen. Um, so it definitely seemed very Frank Underwood to me, so I'm kind of interested to follow and see what this looks like. So then how realistic will elections taking place in 120 days seem like? He might not step down on his own volition, but like, will there be another campaign? Will there be another round of elections? 
I know that people are definitely, like the Haitian people are definitely very hungry to directly elect their president, so I know they want it to happen. But, you know, it's, it's so hard to tell. I mean, what I can say is that during Prevera's inauguration speech, he talked a lot about the country coming together, um, freedom for the press being important, but not once did he mention, hey, we're definitely going to elect this president. He didn't mention the fact that there was going to be an election. So okay. that was conveniently left out of his speech. So I would, um, I would like power to be handed over smoothly. I'd, I'd like to see the people of Haiti get to elect their president, but I don't know if it's going to happen in 120 days. And what are the biggest differences between the new president and Martelli then? Are they like really close? Um, I'm not too sure. I mean, they definitely, I mean, they're from different political parties. Um, Prevert, I guess his biggest thing is that he was the chairman of the National Assembly, so he had a lot of pull and influence in the parliament. Um, but, you know, to be honest, I, I don't personally see a difference between them. I'm, but I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert on Haiti politic, uh, Haitian politics, but I'm sure that, you know, the people there definitely have their own opinions. Okay. Is Martelli still in Haiti or did he have to leave as well? Like, uh, I'm not sure. As far as I know, he's still there and I hope he puts out another bang and single. Yeah. <laughs> sweet Martelli. Is that yeah. It? Sweet Mickey. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Awesome. Well, thanks. Your questions were really good. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, Adam, thanks for coming on. Uh, Nilu, uh, that's the end of our show. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, do you want to say goodbye to everybody at home? Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for tuning in on On the Line. If you have any further questions about Haiti and its politics and its transition, you can hit me up on Twitter at ntabrizi. Oh, shit. They got their guns out. Let's get up there. Let's get back. Let's get back. Let's get back. Let's get back.